that's a goal. Who got the assist? Who got the assist? All right, back on the horse. Hello, hello, hello. So here we are again. We are Who Got the Assist, as Nick's wife said in the intro, and we're back for another season of FPL Fun. That summer did not feel long, 20 days, but nonetheless, the game is open, excitement is building again, and we're actually raring to go. For new listeners, I'm Tom, and my other co-host, Nick and Anthony, who we'll hear from in a second, will be with you hopefully all season. We have no Patreon, we have no pack. It's just us amateur podcasting with hopefully a little crude experience as we begin what is our fourth season podding on fantasy football. For new listeners, welcome. For returning ones, welcome back. And I guess just to remind you who we are and what we do in the beginning, I'd describe us as a data-driven FPL pod to a large extent, but with a little bit of personality thrown in, eh? Nick, would you agree? completely agree with that as our new logo designed by our fantastic graphic designer Marco uh, dictates our modus operandi is to provide FPL insight driven by data um, and now that the new listeners have switched off because they've heard a football podcast using a Latin phrase <laughs> uh, we're back now with the core audience again so hi guys um, joking aside we're here ultimately because we love talking about fantasy football and our goal as content providers is to provide FPL advice and we like to try and back up all of our thoughts, as I said, with statistical analysis. And sometimes we throw a little bit of psychology in as well. Um, and also, hopefully, some entertainment. So, yeah, our newest co-host, Anthony, has definitely added a lot of quality in terms of analysis and uh, provided some dulcet Irish tones as well, uh, which is an excellent, effective counterbalance to our summer less ex- accent. So, uh, Anthony, how are you? I know you've been doing exams. How's your summer gone? Evening, folks. It's good to be back um, after the, uh, what is it, 20 day summer that we had, uh, most of which was me studying for exams. Um, So my five day old summer has been lovely so far. It has rained for all of it um, (laughs) rather typically, but that's fine. Yes, I am indeed the newest co-host on this pod. So welcome to the new listeners. It's uh, great to have you aboard and welcome back to the people who were with us previously as well uh, like there is a great array of pods in the fpl sphere but what i do feel is that if, who got the assist does ground itself in hard data to a much greater extent you know it, it, we largely cast aside the who done it and arsenal just naff me in it approach to evaluating fpl and, and and do our best to at least find the data to ground our arguments and our counter arguments we tend to have good debates between the three of us on pretty much everything as well uh, as for today's episode it's a simple plan for the pod really we're going to wade knee deep in to the player prices that were released over the weekend but we're going to avoid the perils of going in too deep with our analysis given that we don't actually have any fixtures to work with just yet Uh, triple liverpool in game week one sounds absolutely great right now but the fact of the matter is that if man city turn out to be facing promoted teams in aston villa in the first few weeks of the season then that's out the window Uh, i should also note that we will be making allusions to and discussing tom's new and annual talisman theory article which was released just this week throughout this podcast do give it a read um, as i think it highlights an extra dimension to player evaluation in fpl which i think would assist even magnus carlson and i think you should take the chance to actually get an edge while you have a chance yeah, thanks for that it's a very good fun uh, writing talisman theory yet again this season another value article as well as in the works but yeah no very very cool very interesting um doing the analysis that is and hopefully an interesting read as well uh, that is out on twitter and we'll speak about it in a little while so as anthony mentioned today is about pricing but it's about pricing in initial ideas sort of sense so i mean the game reopened surprisingly on saturday who knew that fpl were working on saturdays wow to be honest as i mentioned it was 20 days that we had in terms of breaks between podcasts but I mean scarcely more than that in terms of football and FPL closing and reopening but it really feels like the games just bled into a new season and it feels like it kind of happened about closure and um, but equally you know we've had a few days with the pricing but we don't have the fixtures yet and that's really essential context as Anthony mentioned in which to kind of give really concrete analysis about who's well priced and who really we really should be looking at in the upcoming time period I think it's the first time in fact I'm sure it's the first time FPL has ever opened without fixtures that means that we're analyzing prices today in a vacuum which is kind of perfect actually for this kind of podcast when we're we're only really thinking about prices in an abstract sort of way Uh, but rest assured that we'll have more in-depth analysis once we can ground our thinking with as I mentioned that essential information that the fixtures does provide so FPL reopening this year, guys. It was a it was a bit of a strange time. I found out loads of prices on Friday. The clubs did as well. Um, everyone seems to be getting involved. And suddenly Saturday it was all Bamiyang, TAA, and boom, it was all open. Uh, what was it like for you guys? 
Yeah, it's pretty good. I wasn't as um, swift on the ball as I was last year, unfortunately, with the old um, noticing the website going live. So my ID was 42 last time, which is a pretty cool ID to have. This this time is sort of five figures, unfortunately. So um, not as fast because I was half tired still when, when it did launch. I almost wasn't expecting it because I know previous years they, they have opened on working days. So I, I was almost caught slightly back by the uh, the opening but yeah when when we first got into the website we obviously had a few um, early price reveals the previous day as tom alluded to but uh, my first thoughts generally were wow um no one's particularly expensive it's it's quite a nice even spread of prices there'd been lots of premium assets that had dropped by 0.5 million or a slightly cheaper and uh, and you know it's kind of to be expected, I guess, there is an abundance of premiums, it feels like, this year compared to last year, where no Chelsea players were above 7.5 million, it's just they didn't seem to have any players at the club that were deserving of, of that sort of price. And, and no one at United was above 8.5 million last year. And obviously this year, we've got the likes of Bruno and Martial and, and Rashford, um, who are all more expensive than that. So we saw the, you know, the likes of De Bruyne, but he got a price hike of about 2 million, up to 11.5 million. But to accommodate that, same price as Sterling. We saw Salah and Mane both 12 million as well. Um, no forwards at 11 million or above, which I can't remember a single season where there's ever been no forwards at all, um, 11 million or above, which is typical of that position right now. But yeah, I, I was quite happy in general with the prices because it um, added a lot of flexibility in terms of creating teams immediately. Largely, I would echo everything Nick would say, um, starting with being caught on the hop on Saturday morning by the game being launched in the first place. I also have a, a five-figure user ID, a better ID than last season because I think I was on a boat for the whole entire day that the game launched the season before. So slightly better in that I just slept in and didn't realize that the game was going to launch this time around. In terms of the pricing itself, I think it is that idea that there is just so much better balance and I think there is so many more combinations that you would let's say be verifiably trying when you don't even have the fixtures to try and put together and I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that as Nick alluded to there are just quite a lot of forwards available that are premium but not super premium i.e basically they're below the 11 million mark and at, at that as well I think within the midfielders because of, okay Fernandez has come in and his price is up and there are of course the the Liverpool two Sterling and De Bruyne but there has been a few other players who have come into the midfield ranks most notably Aubameyang which have really meant that there's serious choices to be made there I think that could change obviously when fixtures come out and we have a better idea of who will actually want to come game week one but right now looking at it just from a zoomed out on paper perspective I think as the season develops as well and you know form comes and goes and fixtures come and go I think we will definitely be faced by a lot of dilemmas and I like that I think last season it, it kind of settled into an okay you have your Salah or your Mane or both and you have your De Bruyne or your Serling or both and maybe Aguero at that you know, a little bit of the time of the season. And because there were just so many other cheap options, especially if you'd built up team value, there wasn't a sense of, you know, jeopardy. Mm. I think with, you know, who you don't have, aside from some, you know, random mid price player that you had to pick someone else just because of pure numbers issues. But other than that, um, yeah, so look, look, overall, pretty good. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you on the dilemma. And I'm with you overall, actually, on, on the pricing. I think that in general, it was pretty good. As I mentioned, I think next week we'll properly you know, go into the weeds of 4.5 million defenders, which ones we really like, which ones we don't like with the context of the fixtures and a few more stats behind them. Because kind of, you know, the fixtures do allow us to angle what we're talking about. But, you know, I guess let's start at the back. And amongst the goalkeepers, I mean, you've got Nick Pope, 5.5, an unsurprising hike upwards. Um, and, you know, I, I, there wasn't anything too surprising with the goalkeepers. I mean, we, I was hoping Dubravka would get the 4.5. So I think he'd have been a shoe into my squad if so. Unfortunately, that didn't quite happen. Uh, uh, I think we've got, there's also one very low uh, fit factor in the goalkeepers, which is Carl Darlow, uh, who got the 5.0 for some reason. Uh, yeah. Um, but if, I mean, there are a few kind of options in the 4.5s that I guess I'll be looking at going forward, or uh, I guess I'll be looking at depending on the fixtures. So, you know, Ryan, the eternal Ryan uh, button. Uh, Double up at 4.5, 4.0 is again there. Um, McCarthy has been exhumed again to 4.5. Uh, Emmy Martinez kept the 4.5 as well. I was, I was surprised I didn't put him up to 5 because I thought, well, you know what? He's probably going to start the season. Hmm. And uh, yeah, you know, the likes of, uh, well, the Leeds goalkeepers. Uh, Meslier, it looks like, has got it. According to Leeds fans, uh, Diouf and uh, Jord FPR speaking to over Casilla after a very uh, unpleasant incident that Casilla was involved with. So he could be a decent 4.5. 
elsewhere. Um, the other thing I noticed was that Heaton um, is still injured, which means you've got Neuland and Steer, uh, who are both 4.0 Aston Villa goalkeepers. One of them may all start the season in goal, so he may be able to start with an 8.0 goalkeeper pairing. Um, any goalkeeper surprises for you guys? I'm, I'm assuming not. Emmy Martinez really was the the primary surprise for me, and I think uh, do you know Tom something you were um, definitely said quite a lot post lockdown when we were talking about players was goalkeepers they're just boring you know and I think there is an aspect of do you know most of them are five point oh there's also <laughs> Matt Ryan and you might want Emmy Martinez and it's kind yeah. of like there you go <laughs> yeah I think um, for me it's probably going to be a four point five four point zero combination again in terms of the goalies it's just about picking the right one I don't know if I can go back to Matt Ryan. I think it was completely useless last season. But I think with um, with Nick Pope, 5.5 million, unfortunately, that rules him out for me, especially considering you can cover the Burnley defence with some very nice 4.5 million fullbacks, which I'm sure we'll get onto in a second. Uh, but I found it interesting, actually, that um, most managers at the moment seem to not be bothered about Pope's price. 33.1% of um, FPL managers currently own Nick Pope, so he's the highest owned goalkeeper by far. So clearly, a lot of people just click in, oh, highest scoring goalkeeper from last time he goes in my team which uh, which I found quite insane I did find it quite funny how uh, FPL have preempted a move for Dean Henderson to Henderson or preempted him overtaking uh, David Hay at United and giving him a 5.5 price tag, you know, by dint of his good performances last season. I just, I, I thought that there might be value to be found there just because he was still at United, but no. No. And also Aaron Ramsdale is apparently uh, on his way to Sheffield United. I think any kind of hope that he'll be 4.5 million, judging by that defence last year, is fanciful. I think he'll yeah, 5.0 5. 5. at best. Yeah. 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 I mean, Nick just alluded to it, though. I mean, if you got Nick Pope isn't your bag, but you're interested in the equal second best defence last season, yes, Burnley with the equal second best defence for Liverpool. Um, uh, they kept as many clean sheets as them. And just two behind Man City, who won out in the clean sheet stakes. Um, there are a few options who did keep the 4.5 in the Burnley defence and to be honest in 4.5 defenders there's just so much choice there isn't there uh, you've got the likes of as I mentioned with the Burnley defence uh, Charlie Taylor Eric Peters whoever wins out in that left back uh, kind of role uh, Phil Bardsley and Matt Lowton looks like Phil Bardsley Nick's man from game week 38 has won out um, in that uh, Battle of the boring right back, so it could be a case of starting with Phil Barsley of all people. Oof, no, <laughs> uh, I've got him in my team at the moment, Nick. <laughs> but you got uh, you got uh, Lamptey, um, who um, I, I I keep hesitating and wanted to call him Russell Lamptey, but that's not his name, is it? There was a, there was a footballer called Russell Lamptey, wasn't there? Right. Um, Tariq. Yes, yeah, Tariq, yeah. And there's a KWP 4.5, who's actually less expensive than Jan Valery, who he replaced. Yeah, and uh, Ruben Vinigre as well, um, who may be worth his salt if Nuno does choose him. And if uh, Gulam, um, who's also been uh, slated to join from Nas- Napoli, uh, doesn't join. But lots of 4.5 million value there, isn't there? I mean, feasibly, looking at two or three of them in your team. And you know, there are quite a few players there, amongst the ones I've mentioned and others too, that could feasibly just form the bedrock of your defence going forward, right? Yes, certainly. I think, um, you know, obviously a lot of us are looking at the likes of Trent Alexander-Arnold as the premium choice in defence, but having a supporting cast of 4.5 million and even a couple of 4 million defenders that have um, caught our fancy, Nathan Ferguson, Crystal Palace, looks like he's going to be starting as per an article in The Athletic um, and in the right-back position and um, also potentially Ben Johnson of West Ham. Um, people have been talking about the 4 million option but um, I think for me yeah those 4.5 million uh, defenders really um, really interesting picks there I think um, I mentioned Burnley already but yeah Ruben Vinegar who you mentioned as well with Johnny out with an ACL injury definitely a great choice um, for Wolves considering he's also going to be playing a bit of an attacking uh, role akin to Doherty potentially and um, Wolves don't have those Europa League Thursday night games anymore so they um, can focus purely on the league which, which would be good I think for the the fullbacks prevent them from getting too tired. Other ones you didn't mention, um, high sort over 4.5 million defender Ben White, um, currently of Brighton, but a lot of the uh, top clubs are chasing him at the moment as a choice. Liverpool, City, United, apparently all looking at him according to the Athletic. Also, um, your man Saliba, uh, Arsenal got the 4.5 million price tag, and a few people are talking about him being a starting um, option there. Yeah, maybe just to round off on that, I think I 
calculated that probably 10 teams, so half the division, um, have options at 4.5 mil, which means, uh, as I think Tom used the word bedrock, it's a pretty good word to describe, I think, what they will be for our defences to kind of supplement basically Trent Alexander-Arnold because it kind of feels like the the zoomed out perspective and we'll get to the midfielders and forward is that big at the back doesn't necessarily look like it's going to be the the opening uh, trend when the season comes through anyway. So um, it's kind of an interesting one uh, to ponder because I, I always find it funny that big at the back does seem to have its time and then it goes and then it comes again hard and suddenly we end up with like, I don't know, something like... 20 million spread across three defenders later yeah. on in the season and <laughs> you're just like how yeah. did this happen um but yeah so there are definitely some good options there at that really cheap price yeah i think i i think it probably it's just a kind of a symptom of how the pricing has been done and um, this season that we've kind of got that that we're looking for defense as a place to make savings um normally it was, as we found it was like last season uh, you know big at the back push we were looking at kind of the defence being a place where we're making investments. Now we're using them to make value picks and uh, basically take that money and put it elsewhere. If I may, though, uh, Matt Doherty. No, Doherty. 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 Matt Doherty. Doherty. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you were here last season, you get that. Um, but Matt D, 6.0. I just want to mention him very, very quickly. So we ended last season on 167 points and that's 6.5 million. That's his best return ever. He's been in the Premier League for two seasons, but that's his best return. He improved year on year. And he ended 6.5 million, but was knocked back down to 6.0 again. Um, that's a fantastic price for him. I was expecting him to get 6.5. And in the value data that I've looked at, he's the one who jumps up the most of any player um, because of uh, looking at old pricing versus new pricing. Obviously, he's an expensive differential and obviously Vinagre could well uh, cover for him. Um, but the acid test with that is whether Vinagre do- is able to stay around. Matt D is a proven quantity in the Premier League. Um, and I think that if Wolves do get a decent set of early fixtures and you are able to kind of make that sort of work, um, he could be one that's very interesting to do. I mean, we haven't spoken about a couple the players as well um we haven't spoken about kind of the leads guys and you know, ailing dallas and stuff i think we'll probably look at them a little bit more next week uh, depending on the fixtures too uh, but for now let's move on to the midfield and i think we should move on to the top of the midfield because i think that is the key reason why we're draining funds from everywhere as nick mentioned there's you know, bugger all in the, in, in the forward lines as we mentioned there's a plethora of options in defense the reason why is because premium midfielders are everywhere <laughs> there are so many of them it's an advent of choice this year which means there's lots of side grade potential. We'll speak about that later in terms of the impacts of this pricing. Um, but you know, there's an array of midfielders around the premium mark, aren't there? There's Salah and Mane and Aubameyang. Uh, I think they had to reclassify Aubameyang at 12.0. Uh, KDB and Sterling at 11.5. And then Bruno at 10.5. And all the way down to Rashford at 9.5 and Son at 9. I think those are all fairly decent prices. Apart from one, I was a little bit disappointed that Mane was given the same price as Salah. I felt that, that was a little bit harsh on Mane because Salah, by all intents and purposes, is an FPL monster, has penalties as well. And I, know, I, think, I think Mane being given the 12 was a little bit harsh on him just because I think that he offers um, a different package to what Salah does. And I think that it, it kind of makes him automatically less desirable. I mean, hopefully we'll see some price falls and hopefully, you know, at times during the season, it'll be a really potent differential. But uh, it, it's basically removed the choice between the two of them because Salah is just such an obvious buy, I feel, at least. Um, but yeah, in terms of the premiums, I was very happy with those prices. And Aubameyang had to be 12, big hero, Talisman Theory, and same with Rashford as well, um, had to be given that 9.5. And what do you guys reckon about the premium midfield? I guess there's a lot of options there. Did you like the pricing? Do you like the guys there? Yeah, as I said, the pricing was pretty fair, to be honest. We weren't overly, you know, as I say, screwed over by the players being so expensive that we weren't able to afford any of them at all. I did find it interesting, you know, you've got Salah and Mane, essentially the same price and you've also got De Bruyne and Sterling the same price so it's basically you choose one or one or two and it's quite interesting actually looking at the the data in terms of there seems to be clear picks within the FPL community in terms of who they're going for so Salah's got a 25.9% ownership compared to Mane's 8.3% which is understandable then Sterling he has an 8.3% ownership but De Bruyne's got an unbelievable 62.6% ownership and and whilst I was actually personally thinking for my own team to go for Sterling instead of De Bruyne, um, because I mean Sterling does play, he, he did feel like more aggressive 
player to own. He's more explosive, perhaps, compared to De Bruyne, perhaps slightly more consistent, a bit more reliable. I felt like Sterling was the more exciting, explosive option. But looking at those ownership stats, it, I don't know whether that's, that's too much risk for my own um, appetite to go for Sterling over De Bruyne, even though it could have huge rewards. It could also um, result in your season, you know, collapsing very, very quickly and very swiftly straight away in the first week of the season. So I did, I did find that very interesting in terms of the prices there. And then you've got the Manchester United assets, as you mentioned, Tom, slightly cheap for another another challenging decision to make in terms of which Manchester United assets, whether you go for uh, Fernandez or Rashford or even maybe Martial in the forward line. Um, and obviously Green was the other one we've talk, um, we haven't talked about, but he's another midfielder there. But yeah, in terms of the premium. Uh, midfielders, it, it very much feels like you have to pick one or one of um, two for each club, and obviously Aubameyang, who you mentioned as well, right, cla- rightly classified as a midfield. That just means so much choice this year, and the prices, luckily, aren't so horrible that you have to. You can only fit one or two of them in. You can you can do a setup with three and pretty, perhaps even expensive forward and Trent, and not screw over the rest of your team. Yeah, you've actually set me up quite nicely there, Nick, because I think that's actually part of the issue is that you can have three premium midfielders and Timo Werner and Trent Alexander-Arnold in the same side. I have that right now. It looks relatively balanced. I'm not going to share it because there's no point sharing teams right now, but it is very much possible to do that. And I think by making that triple up of really high premium players accessible, along with what we're going to say is the necessary Alexander-Arnold and Werner, I think um, it is an issue that it, it makes the, the mid-price midfielders easily forgotten. And I think you, you, you don't see many of the, let's say, nine to seven million midfielders being selected all that much. And I, that, that is a, a bit of a pity. And I guess we're gonna, we'll dig into proper impacts later. But that would be my one issue. Because objectively, let's say, we've come to understand 12 or 12.5-ish as kind of the roof for the really top players. And, you know, something north of 10 to being, you know, a real hat tip to... Uh, high scores, an elite player with a good yeah. club, with good prospects, and like, like the fact of the matter is, is that you did need to give a Bamiang man, a Sally, De Bruyne, a Sterling, Fernandez, that. And to be honest, I think Spurs players have been fortunate that it's only Kane that has hit that because you, know, you could objectively have just put Son with ten, and I don't think we'd have been saying that's that's dead unfair. Um, but no. fortunately, that hasn't happened. I think we see every year though that league league positions, league finishing is. That kind of dictates outcomes as well as because the fact that I mean with Son and with Kane last year they were a little bit underwhelming in terms of what we'd expect from them I think Son is still lacking that big season I don't think he's ever quite had that sort of uh, miraculous sort of season where he gets 200 plus in, in, in the way that we want him to for nine yeah and despite the fact he did better than the previous season Oh, very interesting with Son, but as you say, as you're saying, Anthony, like from there all the way down to, I don't know, six point zero, you've got lots of interesting options. Actually, you've got like some Pulisic at eight point five, obviously injured at the moment. Ziyech came in at eight. I mean, we've got some concerns about him because he came in from here to Vizier, and um, we've got the likes of Josie Altidore, the top of mind, but you know, it could be a very interesting one. Um, Greenwood, who Nick mentioned, seven point five, who could be used as a cover pick potentially. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But you've also got, uh, what's really interesting, and perhaps what Anthony was saying as well, and keying into that, was that you do have a lot of choice there with the players that I've mentioned. So even like a Willian, 8.0. Um, so th- there are a few, I guess, fullback positions, if you were to start off with someone that uh, kind of pricey and needed to kind of take some money out. But yeah, I mean, beyond that, there's some cheap players, uh, Trossard, 5.5 coverage at Armstrong and ASM. But it kind of feels like after Suchek at 5.0, it, that's basically it, isn't it? There's this... I guess we're, we're waiting to see who the next Campwell is going to be. Um, FPL Leeds on Twitter has suggested Perveda or Campo at Leeds as being 4.5. I don't, it's very difficult to know, isn't it? Yeah, I think most of those assets um, that you mentioned, there's, there's a few out there with a bit of surprises in terms of the prices and certainly the ones that most people are going to be targeting. As you said, ASM being 5.5 million um, looks quite a, a tasty choice. So I was, I was surprised to see that he hadn't had um, a price hike. Um, Sue Check, as you mentioned, Tom, he's five million. He's currently in my draft. This, this is for me that felt like a, a bargain, to be honest, because he, he looked really good actually post lockdown. The next three goals and was before I think he was in the top ten for shots on target for midfielders, thanks to his sort of you know six foot four frame, getting so many headers off the bat of corners and things like that. So he he was the one that certainly caught my eye, and as you said. 
Armstrong, a guy who I had in the lockdown um, period, but not the weeks he scored, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, I think um, certainly it's all about the premiums, isn't it, with the midfielders and maybe like one player, perhaps around that 7, 7.5 million mark. You've got Mason Mount, you didn't mention 7 million, some other one that I thought was quite kindly priced, only got a 0.5 million price hike, even though he'd um, performed pretty well for Chelsea over the course of the season. James Madison as well at seven. I uh, probably should have yeah, mentioned another, that as well. Another one that's been, yeah. and, and Grealish as well, if Grealish gets yeah. a move. If he goes to City at that price, then it's it's that seems it's, to be really good. It, and, and actually, to be honest, Mahrez at 8.5 is actually still, I think, going to be one of those arguments that's going to be had over and over again as, you know, does Mahrez cover Sterling forward slash K, uh, KDB? No, but kind of based on value is the long and the short of it I think as well one one player I think that could have benefited from a 5.0 price tag instead of a 5.5 was Jaume Moutinho I know it's just it's a, a real random pick to be talking about here but you know he is someone who gets north of five assists a season and chips in with probably a goal or two in the season and I think he could have been a really interesting option at 5.0 and maybe a bit of a foil to Susek as well when there seems to be very very little um, talent to be kind of got out there as well Mason Greenwood has been made a midfielder and he is 7.5 okay on paper it objectively is a good decision to move him if you're moving Aubameyang and you're moving Rashford into midfield my issue with this is that just because I as I've said I reckon that that mid-price midfielders are largely being overlooked I think Greenwood is going to be overlooked because of that and if he was a 7.5 million forward he would have been a really really good option there especially if he starts you know don't sign Sancho etc etc yeah, I think we'll get into it in a little bit in terms of the impacts. But um, with Greenwood, I think what's really interesting is the fact that he's at a 7.5. So if you think about it as a wider sort of kind of uh, zoom out view as you've been putting it, Kevin De Bruyne in, Salah in, uh, Aubameyang, maybe some people in. I mean, is there then space for a Bruno? Probably not if you want to have a balanced team. So maybe Greenwood does provide 7.5 the nice sort of cover pick. And I was saying on um, on our Slack earlier on, it's not even a flipping Riker, is it? It's like the fourth officer. It's like a wharf pick because it's like you've got Bruno, who's probably the captain. You've got Rashford, who's probably the Riker. Then you've got Martial, who's probably the data. And then you're down to the wharf or maybe, I don't know, Deanna Troy, it was saying, but I think the Troy pick's probably uh, Harry Maguire or something. Uh, but yeah, fourth choice. 7.5 million doesn't really have the kind of the the depth of history in terms of his experience. But with, with him at 7.5, I do kind of feel like it reminds me of TAA being 5.0 a little bit. Like I feel like we, we might look back on him in a few years' time, given what we saw at the end of last season, how good he was, and um, before they all got knackered, how good he was. When, when we look back at him being a 7.5 million midfielder and we think, God, I can't believe we used to we, we got him at that price one year. It definitely has that feel about him. He's that kind of player, isn't he? Yeah, and actually, uh, he's also in my draft at the moment as that Manchester United cover. So if you if you want Aubameyang, Salah, and De Bruyne, then you think actually I don't have any Manchester United players in my draft any longer. Then Greenwood fills that void very nicely, and he did look excellent in the postseason. I think if you had look at him versus Marcus Rashford for two million more, as long as obviously if, if Sancho signs or someone signs, then it's a different story. But Considering Greenwood only played about 1,300 minutes, he, he somehow ended up with double figures for goals. And it's just incredible to say that. He like, appeared from nowhere last season, didn't he? He ended up with double figures for goals, reclassified as a midfielder, with his potential only being 7.5 million. It looks, looks ridiculously um, well-priced. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You've, you've made a compelling argument. Just want to say that. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, you've, you kind of swung me on that, that maybe I think I've been a bit too blinded trying to fit my premiums in so far. But I, I think especially if you only have good early fixtures, I'd be trying to get them in. Like I, I currently have Penalty Fernandez in the team instead of um, any other United players. But I think that that could change up because surely to God, United can't get 15 penalties in the season again. <laughs> you never know. You never know. You know Green was in 21.3% of the uh, team still at the moment. So one in five, which is very interesting. Um, uh, so let's move on. Uh, we were saying, you know, about about United um, and about Martial perhaps being an interesting buy as well. So let's move into the forwards. And as Nick said earlier on, I don't think there's ever been a year when the forwards have been so almost neglected. Maybe it's a victory for WGTA in some ways because we have been saying for quite a few years there is no value in the forwards, and this is definitely true here. Um, I mean, you've got Kane, you've got Guerra at ten point five, you've got Vardy at ten. Um, but I mean, really, I think. 
we're looking at Werner, we're looking at Martial, we're looking at Ings, looking at Jimenez as well. I mean, Jimenez has been completely devoid from Twitter. He's in 22.6% of the squads. Um, and we're kind of looking for value here because, again, we're looking to try to prop up a very, very expensive midfield um, by doing, I don't know, it, for me at the moment, it looks like kind of saying, right, you know, an Ing sort of type, Martial sort of type, and uh, Stag, you mentioned you had Werner in, uh, somewhere around that, plus one sort of cheapy, and off you go. And there's four 4.5 million forwards, by the way, this year um, at the moment. Um, there's Keenan Davis. Um, and around the 4.5s as well, you've got Vasilev, you've got um, Conor Bickham, and you've got Brewster, uh, Rian Brewster, who may well end up at a Premier League club, apparently. So that could be in- incredible value if he does go at 4.5. Um, as I've mentioned, as well, just run through them. Uh, Kane, 10.5, decent exit velocity. Uh, Martial, 9.0 is pretty decent. Ings and Jimenez, we predicted on the very last pod of last season at 8.5, same price together, very cool. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Mitrovic as well, one I want to pick up on quickly. Uh, 6.0, um, the years before 2018 19, they started out with him at 6.5. So they've learned a lesson from that and put him down to 6.0. According to Talisman Theory, uh, from Pookie won it out last year. Um, Mitrovic could be a very interesting kind of purchase around 6.0, just to kind of prop you up. And I an interesting meme on that. But there you go. Um, the forwards in general are less, less expensive, aren't they? Um, and it kind of looks like we're filling two slots with them, plus having one filler. That kind of feels like how it is to me. Have you guys spot any value in the forwards, or is it just about two of those slots being filled and one being written off? I mean, how are you guys looking at it at the moment? Well, so I have actually been experimenting with a sort of four-five-one type setup at the moment, um, just because of the flexibility that allows in midfield in terms of spending the money and um, in the defence as well. But the, the player that I did have as that one forward is, is Timo Werner. Um, obviously, he's new to the Premier League, so it's always a little bit of a risk to, to go for a player that's um, never played in the league before. But I think just considering his record in the Bundesliga, where he did get 32 goals, um, that's just incomparable to any other forwards um, in the Premier League. N- none of them did anything close to 32 goals last season. So I think that, that statement alone makes me um, quite attracted to to owning Timo in my team and then putting some trust in him, perhaps obviously fixtures permitting it's only an initial draft. Um, in terms of the prices, I think Aguero is one that perhaps will be, you know, in the, he's going to be in the in the conversations at some point over the course of the season, isn't he? He's another one that's had a bit of a price fall. Um, started last season, if you remember, at 12 million and um, down to 10.5 million. So he's had a 1.5 million price drop, which is quite incredible considering when he was actually fit, he was Ooh. really, really good. 16 goals in one four four nine nine minutes. I'm not going to calculate that on the spot, but that's a pretty damn decent um, ratio. I think, uh, you know, that's less than half the season. So that would have been 32 goals if he kept that and played every minute of the game, um, every minute of the season. So, He's one that I caught my eye a little bit as an option later on in, in the season. Um, the, in terms of the other prices, I guess, obviously Ings is certainly interesting to keep an eye on. 8.5, same with him. And as you mentioned, Tom, very much dependent on the fixtures. I actually was quite, I actually quite like Mitro's, Mitrovic's price. As you said, he dropped down to 6.5, um, from 6.5 to 6 this season. Um, which, uh, yeah, makes him a bit of a bargain, to be honest. I was expecting the 6.5 for him. Last time he was in the Premier League, he did get 11 goals, so he managed double figures, which is, is pretty reasonable for a forward. Um, and certainly would be, um, certainly he's looking like he's Fulham's talisman as well. So one to keep an eye on. Um, finally, before we move on to some of the other players, I'm sure St- uh, Stag will jump in with the likes of Antonio. Um, I wanted to mention Firmino's price, 9.5 million, 2 million more than Trent Alexander-Arnold which I just thought was crazy, considering Trent got 33 FPL returns, because clean sheets are FPL returns. Firmino got only 18. To be 2 million less than, than Firmino just seems ridiculous. So I found that a bit of an odd pricing, but not really an odd pricing. It's completely expected, to be honest, because of the way defensive values. But um, yeah, uh, what do you want to add, guys? Yeah, it, it would have been gas if Firmino had come in at 7.5 like to reflect value and we had to have this discussion on Twitter that actually Trent Alexander-Arnold represents better value even though, yeah, that, that would have been uh, quite tough to uh, considering he is a player who only scores away from home, it seems, nowadays. Um, I think something that's worth noting is that there were quite a few positional changes. So Tony Martial, Richarlison, my favourite, and uh, Mikel Antonio are now all forwards, um, which is... Uh, 
they present uh, interesting questions, I guess. Antonio seems also to be particularly favorably priced at 6.5 million. Um, he had, according to Tom's uh, Tasman theory article, he had exit velocity bordering on diarrhea. It was uh, exiting so quickly. So he was, he was very good at the end of last season, mostly thanks to, you know, destroying Norwich in one game but still um, particularly good end season and I think you will see that he will be popular in a lot of teams but I think maybe the the standout for me was just the lack of options below 6.0 in terms of strikers like to be honest like okay you've got Mitrovic at six we've talked about him a little bit already and I think he is actually a particularly good pick even though I think there's a lot of people with PTSD after his Fulham season and how he kind of dropped off quite dramatically there but I thought maybe Aaron Connolly um it's it's quite hard to find and maybe Shea Adams at six I think there'll be people talking about him that that feels risky to me but there aren't that many options there at that lower price maybe Charlie Austin if he's playing a bit but I'm not quite sure if that's the case mm-hmm. so there isn't there isn't um yeah and, and that's another PTSD in and of itself so oh, yeah. there's, there's a serious uh, lack of value at that low price but it, it does kind of fully set just it kind of it reflects the whole entire kind of what have we gone with ignoring of forwards and in, in the overall sense of things and there just is much much better value in midfielders to the point that I think beyond uh, the Uren zone for the Bundesliga fans Emo Werner uh, it's going to be quite hard to you know, justify having certainly having a four three three type setup. It doesn't we're not going to see that four four two rare. Um, it, and that'll be a team basically that has either Jimenez or Ings in there. Yeah, yeah. interesting. No, I think you're right, and I think that um, Timo Werner is one who's very interesting. I think that you know a few people have mentioned him, and obviously uh, during the course of the fancy Bundesliga season, where we, I think the, all three of us played at the end of last season in the absence of FPL. Uh, no, Sag didn't. Okay, no, no, I, I, did I play. consciously objected. <laughs> consciously objected. Okay, fair enough. And Conchi. Uh, but yeah, we played, and uh, I watched a fair bit of Werner, and he was incredibly frustrating uh, to own because he had, uh, I think, it was four shots per game, and he missed three of them. Um, but he did score a lot. So just to give a quick shout out to our friend uh, FPL Orsamo, uh, busy in his helicopter above uh, all the games, um, it, he did a quick thread uh, in prospects in the prospect style. If anyone remembers what that was, Nick and I used to go through lots of players and calculate how they'd done if they were in FPL last season. Uh, but uh, Osmo calculated that last year he had 34 appearances, scored 28 goals, three of which were hat tricks, five of which were braces, um, eight assists. That uh, works out as 0.9 goals per 90 minutes, 0.26 assists per 90 minutes. And he last year would have bagged 222 points, which would have been the highest point scoring FPL forward um, especially for a very attacking team like Chelsea that 9.5 million is pretty interesting and that's kind of the same price that Higuain uh, came in at right um, I think that Vern is a little bit skinnier a little bit more light on his feet than Higuain uh, so we may well find that Werner may be of more interest I think he's definitely got that sort of uh, Aubameyang sort of profile about the kind of player that he is and I, I just think the 9.5 is really interesting especially in the absence of a talisman for Chelsea I think it was Willian and Tammy Abraham who both kind of matched that out and uh, no, with Hazard leaving there was a real gap to be filled no one quite did it last season but Werner could well do it this season going forward but yeah I think for me in, in that kind of Mid price bracket at the moment. I think it's going to have to be Ings just because he was a talisman last season for Southampton. I think it was a three and ten of their points he scored. And depending on how the fixtures go, I think he is the one I'm going to go with 8.5 because it means you can still kind of jump around. And I'm just traumatized, frankly, by the amount of times that somebody in our Slack has written oh, no, Dings, no, Dings. No, 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 and I have no. not owned Danny Ings. I mean, Nick, you only won one game week last season. I owned him throughout the day. Yeah, Miss Penalty for you. I owned him during the the spate of games. He didn't do anything. And I don't know. I feel like he's going to go from niche to hygiene this year. So maybe it may be the case that we're looking looking up for new Danny Ings. But um, if they do a good fixture, I think he'll be the one for me, even though I do like Mitro, I do like Mitro as kind of the guy next to him. But I also do like Werner. I think that one million is quite tough to do, especially for an unproven quantity, if I can use one million elsewhere. Uh, right, okay. Let's take a break there and we'll move on to the impacts. Cool. Who got the assist? Who got the assist? So we're back and I think that um, after kind of going through all the prices and talking about kind of all that, it's worth meditating for a little bit. And then, as I said earlier on, we'll definitely will have a few more kind of uh, 
grounded in fixtures, at least uh, advice, recommendations for how we're going to approach game week one. But kind of zooming out, as Stag said a few times, um, and thinking about kind of the strategic impact, I suppose, of the pricing that we've seen, I think we've broken it down into kind of two key impacts, which are impacts on formation and impacts on the market. And just to start formation, I think it's going to be abundantly clear to anybody who's made a team and has been kind of even vaguely engaged in the FPL kind of discourse on social media. Um, 3 5 2, 4 4 2, probably going to be fairly common, aren't they, guys? Maybe even a 4 5 1, as Nick was saying, he's experimenting with. It's very hard to see how three forwards can d- deliver value. And I think that that's. Uh, Second year in a row, we've kind of seen four four two. Remember Nick, uh, Neil Murray on the uh, on the Unwritten Rules pod last season said that it might be the first year that the winner plays four four two all the time, or you know uh, something like that. I think maybe this year is going to be the year, especially where we're going to see kind of two forwards being uh, the formation do draw right. I, I mean, in the past we've accepted three four three as being keeping it simple, but maybe now things have changed. Do we, do we think that's true, or am I just kind of making that up from uh, infernal? reading of FPL Twitter? I think that is fair to say. Certainly the the free free line front line looks like it's completely dead. And you can see that as well within the ownership figures. Again, the fact that Keenan Davis, for instance, is a 20.1% ownership. And you've also and you know that's that's more than the likes of Kane, who only has 11.4, it's more than the likes of Vardy, who's only attracting 9.7%. Um, of owners at the moment, these sort of the sixth highest owned forwards, which suggests that so many people are going for that sort of, you know, those cheaper forwards. Same with Connor Wickham, not as popular as Davis, but 7.2% ownership. Bruce has got 3.9. So certainly at least a, a significant population are going for these sort of very cheap forwards that can rot on the bench. And, you know, there is that, that really is the absence of, you know, good value picks outside the likes of Werner perhaps or Ings or Jimenez. It just there's just no no one really that kind of springs to mind that you really want. And when you look at, you know, what going cheap at the front gets you, gets you these expensive midfielders. And it's all about that these are the glamour picks, you know, these attacking midfielders that are getting all the points, all the goals, all the all the FPL returns and, and a player like Trent as well. It's just, you know, going for a four five one seems like a logical option right now or or a free at least a three five two certainly and I think three five two is probably going to be the optimum and the most popular formation um, at the start of the season I think this year. Basically because of the way that they've priced things, it does mean that it's going to be very hard to have any more than two strikers and probably any more than one striker if you go for Timo Werner. It's going to be very hard to fit in, let's say, the two of someone around the pricing of Ings and Jimenez at 8.5 or Richardson at 8 if that's what you're into. Uh, Pain and agony, suffering and a poor player. But um, but basically, just because there are so many of these premium midfielders that we have to have in our team, quote-unquote, that's probably north of 30 mil of your budget used up on three players in midfield and that just means that there just is not going to be enough space especially if we consider that 7.5 million uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold is a requirement as well something I was saying in the off time to Nick was that it's actually a pity they didn't make him 8.0 because if he was that expensive I think it would have made it more of a difficult choice for people that um, at the moment, it took 7.5 is something that is the amount that we pretty much all had tied up in him in value at the end of last season. It's something we're all used to paying for him, but it probably isn't even enough. If he was a midfielder who'd returned those points, he'd be nine million easily. And the fact of the matter is that if he was 8.0, we might have start we might have started to look at getting okay. You could have your cheap Liverpool defender. You could have a whole entire defense, basically 5.5 and basically a bunch of 4.5s and a four maybe in Ferguson. And then suddenly you could even be looking at trying to get that other striker let's say you could have you could fund a much more balanced 442 where the defense is pretty neglected or an even stronger 451 with another premium midfielder or one of those uh, 8.0 7.5 million ish midfielders that i feel are going to be ignored just because people are going to be trying to squeeze really just dross in around a starting 11 and very little more depth absolutely absolutely and i think that in terms of TAA, you're absolutely right that I'd have put him at that Leighton Baines 
I really would have. And I think that point five does make things a tiny bit easier because he finished last season, lest we forget, at 7.7. So he's, again, been brought back a little bit, which is quite interesting. I, I, I don't know who's been pricing that. Um, and in terms of the value data, which I, again, will release fairly soon, he's actually second in that metric. So even at 7.5 million, what he represents in terms of uh, price per cost is absolutely ridiculous. It's easy enough to include him and also include the rest of your objectives. And I think it goes without saying that we all think that you should. I and mean, we didn't speak about Robbo. We didn't speak about Virgil van Dijk earlier. Um, and those guys are great value. But because we didn't speak about them earlier, it probably belies the fact that they are probably going to be overlooked going forward. And I think that's probably true because they are quite expensive and that money is better spent elsewhere with the plethora of 4.5s and the fact that there's, you know... All the money needs to go they're, to the premium they're victims. Builders. They're victims of the same problem that all of the forwards are effectively, exactly. you know, south of Jimenez and Ings. Exactly. I mean, Robertson had a fantastic um, restart period, actually. He kind of went back to two years ago, Robertson, the very start. Um, but I mean, at the moment, they look like great value for a zombie team. Um, they look like the kind of players that you, you, know, you double up with Trent and one of those two and leave them in if you were running a zombie team. But I think that it probably is not the case at the moment for this year. But Robbo and DVD, you can start off with. I think maybe when we reconfigure and things kind of get a bit clearer, then maybe we do that. Here's obviously the old big at the back we were talking about last season with the double de- defence. And I think it goes back to that same old argument, though. If you're going for, to go for two forwards, one of them being 6.5 million, 7 million, do you think that that player is going to outscore Virgil van Dijk or Robertson over the course of the season? Yeah. Or do you, think, do you think Liverpool are going to get 12 clean sheets, for instance? Can that... Can that forward score 12 goals plus any additional attacking returns that the likes of Van Dijk and Robertson can also deliver as well? And, you know, looking at their previous performances, 180 points, um, above 180 points two seasons in a row, I, I don't think that those forwards around that Mitrovic price can deliver. And I think that one of the guys on the Slack group, after I said that Big at the back was dead, uh, B&M Matt, he, he pointed this, um, he, he reminds me of this particular point to say that, that you know, these defenders, the premium defenders, can still outscore those um, cheaper forwards. They absolutely can. It's just the fact that if you're looking at them as a zombie value purchase, that you're leaving there over the course of the season, absolutely. Um, but last season, Ings was 6.0 to begin with. I'm not saying the Mitrovic is ever going to be an Ings. Um, it would be nice if he was, but it probably isn't going to be. But at the same time, it's good to have that slot open. I don't think we're going to be kind of sitting there 38 game weeks later and laughing about the fact that we've had that kind of percentage yield from BVD. Um, I think that he it looks very, very good as a, as a kind, of, kind of a value pick. Robertson, we'll have to see. One more, one other thing before we move on to the market impact um, in terms of the formation impact is that I don't know how many drafts you guys put together. I put a psychological sort of thing out to say, you know, adaptive preference, say some cost fallacy. It may not be the best thing to be making lots of drafts, especially about a fixture list, because you're going to be sitting there kind of thinking, this is great. You know, I'm so into this right now. And this is a great team. I don't want to lose these players. I'm, I'm, I'm locked into them now. And um, yeah, don't do that, guys. But as soon as fixtures comes out, just completely throw all of your entire template complex out the window and start again. But one problem I am having is the 10th and 11th man. So we've got all of these sort of expensive midfielders you mentioned. Um, and we've got the necessity to have TAA. So at the moment, I've got kind of Suchek, a 4.5 million defender, who is Vinagre, and the 4.0 in Nathan Ferguson. Two of those every week I'm going to be relying upon. Um I mean, enablers is always going to be absolute gold, but I think in teams at the start of next year, we are going to see that sort of kind of 10th and 11th man weakness in a lot of the team sheet. It's, it's definitely the case that we're kind of relying on a couple of ropey picks, aren't we, in our 11 to kind of necessitate the fact that we're kind of trying to be budging in an extra, an extra premium this year. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the likes of Salah, KDB, TAA are in for certain, and you've got Aubameyang or Bruno Fernandes. I mean, that doesn't leave very much, does it? At some point, there are going to be savings. And with the fact that you're going to end up with, you know, quite a lot being spent, those kind of marginal players are, are quite difficult, aren't they? I guess we're hoping that Nathan Ferguson at 4.0 is either a great first bencher or able to pick up the slack. 
it's inevitable, isn't it? I think we've always had these sort of players that have to, you know, enter our teams and, and do a role. If we're going to want to own all the best players, and then, you know, we're going to have to fit in the, these cheaper enablers. And we had an abundance of them last season, as you know, the four million guys like John Lundstram emerging and um, previous season as well, we had AWB, who was a, a four million defender in that same position for Crystal Palace at right back. So, you know, you have these players that come in, do a job for you whenever they're called upon. Often they often they score on the bench and blank when they're in your team. That's just an inevitable part of FPL. But, you know, the, the, you if you try and think about spending an extra 0.5 million, an extra 1 million, especially with the midfielders, you know, six looking at the six million midfielders, there's no one really there, is there? So why not just go as cheap as you can, get a player like Suchek who can do a job for you, might get the occasional goal and, and make those savings to get the players that you really want, those premium assets, your Bamiangs, your De Bruyne's and Salas and Werner's and, and fit them all into your team. I think maybe there is, uh, you could extend the argument that I was making that Trent Alexander-Arnold has been underpriced to some of the premium midfielders. And I don't mean that from an objective perspective of what we think is a high price. Uh, 12-ish is very high. And, you know, even 10.5 Fernandez is, you know, it's it's a premium price. It's an elite price. But if if Fernandez was 11.5 and the likes of Salah were up at 13 I think we would start to see an awful lot more variance in teams because people would just be like okay three premiums is just not three three premium midfielders and a Werner Ings or Jimenez type is just not possible so therefore we're going to have to really you know make the best of these pre these mid-priced midfielders etc and like it's just not making that possible and so what we do end up with is as Tom said is that extreme weakness in that 10th and 11th man relying on your 4.5 defenders far more so than you'd like and relying on you know very kind of uh, an eclectic mix of 5.5 ish or lower uh, price midfielders to kind of flesh out your side like I have both Susek and Alan San Maximan in my current side and they're not they will not be there on game week one I guarantee you both of them but one of them might be you never know Uh, but it's that that overall problem I think that we're going to have that at least starting we're all going to think that we need to have this power seven in terms of our attacking players or whatever and yeah. maybe we'll move away from that as time goes on as there clearly is value at 6.0 if, if someone has a Josh King type season of a few years ago then we'd have to jump on that but for now it doesn't look like we're going to be looking at it that way all right um, and the, I think the, the other kind of big impact on the market so I guess Every year, uh, Nick, especially as the man across the market forces, which is when every week we look at how the movers and shakers kind of go. And um, I think that with the fact that you've got lots of kind of interchangeable players at certain price points, I think that this year there's going to be a lot of choice um, in the market. Uh, be prepared uh, for lots of infernal kind of stick or twist questions in your minds. And I think that there's lots of kind of strategic questions around that as well, because I think that people are going to be kind of thinking, oh, you know, should I stay with this player? Am I going to be hoping for the kind of be rewarded for my patience? Or am I going to twist and see like this sort of instant returns from doing that, especially in, in kind of areas where we, we don't really expect that, especially in the premiums. Normally the kind of the received wisdom is to stick around and kind of hope for the best. Um, but I think this year, a couple of things that I think are going to happen is that we're going to see a kind of a higher net hits um, than before um, due to the fact that you've got all of these fantastic options Um inside grade sort of uh, zones we're able to do that and the other thing as well is that i think there may well be an early wild card for a lot of people um because of the fact that by game week three we may well see that some of the popular picks before the season starts haven't done as well and um, there are a few premium players who are in adjacent slots who were able to kind of move across to few people, people may be thinking you know what i've made that move get rid of it you know get rid of my wild card and kind of do a big big kind of, sort of overhaul uh, one of the big problems of that of course um, if you've been following kind of uh, Ben Crudden in particular is that there's a game week 16 cut off for the wild card there's some jiggery poker around game week kind of 18 19 with blank and the double um, so maybe that could be a really good time to wild card so normally you have half the season uh, to wild card with this year it's a little bit less than that and there's a little bit of kind of uh, intrigue around how we're going to deal with that kind of later kind of purpose so maybe you get a late wild card maybe very very good this year I'm not sure everybody's going to do that. Um, but anyway, I mean, in terms of market impacts, I mean, Nick, and normally you're the market forces man. What's going to happen with the market? And do you think we're going to see a lot of side grading? 
Yeah, I certainly think this season, especially, there's so much uh, potential for for sideways moves. You you look at the prices, especially with the prices. You know, starting with Liverpool, you've got Salah and Mane. One scores, the other doesn't. You know, there's that going to be that red roulette. But I don't think it's just going to be Liverpool this season. You're going to have Manchester City and Manchester United, where there's going to be so much kind of flittering between the two. For instance, with City, it might be that we talked about De Bruyne and Sterling, but if Mahrez scores a brace in game week one, everyone's going to go crazy trying to put him into your team, put him into their team and sell their other City assets potentially to do that. Or Aguero might suddenly come into vogue very, very quickly if he's fit. And again, with United, Bruno, Martial, Rashford and Greenwood all could be in your team or out your team. And people are going to be chasing those points, I feel like, just trying to to follow the, the one that's supposedly in form out of the, the squad. And I think, you know, that is going to... I think we perhaps we'll talk about it a little bit more when we discuss unwritten rules um, in an upcoming pod as well. But I think certainly it's going to have quite a significant impact in the market just that there's so much choice within those top sides this season, something we didn't really have um, in the previous few seasons as well. I, as, aside from echoing that, it's it's very hard to disagree. Really, like the, the fact of the matter is, is that like we we've said it multiple times already. But I think it was there was a vacuum in FPL when Eden Hazard left, and that had not been filled until now. And I think it's actually been overfilled. It's like um, when the liquidators were trying to bury all the goods after the Chernobyl. Um, disaster and they had to bury everything to make sure that it didn't give off too much radiation it's kind of like that that we've kind of the the Eden Hazard problem has been very much buried and instead we've got like mounds upon mounds of premium midfielders that are going to be giving us headaches to choose from it it is definitely I think the the early wildcard strategy is something which I had certainly been convinced by by the time uh, last season ended and I was trapped as everybody got the better of me with wild cards later in the season but I felt like I'd lost out by not having value built up earlier in the season and that was <laughs> that was because I wild carded late at the start of the season and um kind of uh, screwed myself over in that way but there is this uh, added issue and it's a pity actually that it, there is this added issue that's going to come with the slight like jiggery pokery as you say Tom with game week 6 being the cutoff and potential of uh, doubles and etc around those but it's a pity that we didn't have um, United or uh, City through to the latter further latter stages of the Champions League cause, or the Europa League because that would have caused uh, potentially an early double game week or United missing early fixtures etc which could have really uh, caused extra havoc and would have I think legitimized the early wild card a lot more unfortunately we obviously don't have that because uh, yeah. Pep overthinks and United can't score <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, mean, I, I think that it kind of feels like those two outcomes were unanticipated. I think we all thought that City would swat Lee on the side, and it was a baffling tractor uh, league, in it formation. Yeah, exactly. Farmers League, Farmers League England. Actually, uh, but it was a baffling <laughs> decision by Pep um, to match and respect Lee on the extent he did. Um, that's my amateur take on it. And uh, whatever happened, United happened, uh, uh, Sevilla, uh, Europa uh, League, especially. Thir- thir- 33 shots or something like uh, that yeah, it was no, in two I mean, in two games. And they scored twice, thanks to penalty Fernandes. Like, to, to, you know. to, res- to resurrect a, uh, a, pr- a trope from last year. Variants, it's all variants, all outcome bias. You know, it's the crap. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it's, 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 um, it, I think both of those outcomes are, were crazy unlikely but it does mean for FPL managers we have a very orthodox start of the season where it could have been a really interesting one and uh, in terms of the wild card as you were saying uh, Anthony I think it's going to be um, less incumbent on managers to wild card early I think that uh, we'll talk about it next time in terms of the fixtures because the fixtures fall but there's a game week free kind of term and maybe things could be different or whatever 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 uh, but as it stands, it, it could well be that holding the World Cup, that game week 16 sort of uh, mess around could be very useful. Uh, the final question here is, are there any locks in our team's pending fixtures? So I think Trent Alexander-Arnold certainly a lock in my team. Potentially Salah as well, fixtures permitting for Liverpool. And then it's just going to be a City and the United asset that, that will be locked in. Yeah, I, I totally get that, Nick. Like in, in my own team, it's uh, it's Trent Alexander Arnold is a lock into my side, and I think I would have paid eight point five million, not to mind seven point five for the uh, the honor of having him in my side. I, I currently have Kevin De Bruyne in my side, but 
that could be Raheem Sterling. I think it's the sort of, you know, goal chasing thing um, that I you could totally convince me as the season approaches. But for now, De Bruyne is in my side, along with Salah, I felt it was locked in, but like, really? Um, Tom, instead, actually, Tom's Talisman Theory article has convinced me that Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, as a midfielder, even at 12.0, is a basically a requirement for my side in game week one. Um, I, I don't think I'll ever captain him because I can't trust him as far as I throw him. But at the same time, I think he has to be in my side purely because of the volume of goals that he scores and he gets more points <laughs> now <laughs> for so his goals. Though, that's the issue. And, uh, and okay. then Timo Werner. And then um, the Uren's own Emo Werner. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, good old Emo. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of in the same sort of boat with these guys. So... Um, Trent, Salah, both monsters of uh, FPL in general. Um, no use to looking past those. No KDB was the man for a lot of people. I can also buy going with Sterling. I really can. Um, if he is always goals versus over assists in FPL. The problem is, is that KDB had a Yaya Torre sort of year where he got goals and assists. You know, Eden Hazard sort of style is for his fellow compatriot. If you continue that, then fantastic. It's just a case of whether I start the season with KDB or start the season with Sterling, knowing the fact that 0.1 million at the start of the season is 0.5, basically, because it can snook you so bad. Um, maybe it might be the case I go defensive at the start of the year. And as Stag mentioned, my Tasman Theory article and a lot of the work that I've done, um, especially on value as well, which will be coming out soon, um, basically just makes me look at Aubameyang and kind of think 12.0 fielder. That's ridiculous, frankly. Um the other things that I think we'll probably come on to next week in terms of our proper kind of depth analysis are um, uh, two potential approaches uh, to drafts. I'm going to mention them here, drop them, and not really go into them too much afterwards. One is the price point occupancy draft, uh, which is the idea of filling price points with players, even though you probably, even though you perhaps aren't particularly too excited about them. It just gives you the flexibility. So having a player like, you know, Vardy or a Werner in midfield, having those sort of two or three players in the premium um, sort of slots, having TAA, and that kind of allows you the max flexibility. It's like one way you approach your drafting. Another one is ownership coverage. Um, so um, basically looking at ownership in terms of uh, the FPL uh, app and kind of just covering the players who are highly owned at the very beginning, um, that could feasibly feed into the price point occupancy or it could just feed into how you start off if you want a very defensive start. Um, but yeah, Salah, TAA, KDB or Sterling and Aubameyang are my kind of, uh, at the moment, locks in my team. I think Salah and TAA and one of the City boys is definitely a lock. Um, I do want some United kind of cover, but no, it's, it's very, uh, yeah, it's just so hard to do, isn't it, without the fixtures. And honestly, with uh, so much uncertainty, just like, okay, fixtures are a pretty big uh, problem to be have when you're trying to pick a team. But also the fact that we don't know what's going on with this whole Jaden Sancho thing just yet. And yeah. the fact of the matter is that he comes into the league, that it's a pretty big difference. He does seem to be a, a bit of a generational talent uh, by every sort of metric that you can use. If you look at his age, if you just look at his raw numbers in the Bundesliga this season, if any, just him coming in would really, really throw the cat amongst the pigeons. And you couldn't say, oh, he's going to have to settle. He's been playing in a different league. And he's like, no, he's he's English. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's definitely a kind of Salah level um, sort of player, isn't he? If you want to use a touchstone in that sort of regard. Um, I think maybe if he doesn't come for another year, uh, Greenwood may get a very precious year, especially in midfield, as I mentioned earlier on. But yeah, it, it's really, really interesting how that... A, a year out. to prove that he too is a generational talent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A year, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it seems like he's kind of going to be a striker, really, rather than being a, a winger. Um, it's kind of, kind of how he's being fitted in at the moment. But anyway, that's by the by. Um, the other thing to mention kind of quickly on this podcast um, is a talisman theory. Um, so I, I popped up my article uh, earlier on today, and it's been overwhelming, actually. It's been very, very nice uh, to hear kind of the, the response to it, see the response to it. And there's a few kind of uh, key outputs uh, that come from it. But I guess that the kind of the key ones are that Aubameyang is really strongly recommended in terms of the data as a buy for your teams. Uh, QMS Pen and the Red and Game Week ones had in the article. And you need to keep an eye out for the, for the next things. Uh, but the likes of Ings, um, who basically won out a lot of the time, apart from Aubameyang, um, are fantastic kind of uh, pickups. Uh, I think Pookie was the main kind of victory um, 
in terms of uh, Pookie was main victor in terms of the Tasman Fury article just because they didn't score that many points in Norwich, but Pookie scored the vast the, the lion's share of them. Um, what do you guys think about that? Like I thought this year's article, I think it's given that you know this is the third year that I've read the article, so you know obviously the, the numbers change, the players change, the concept doesn't. Um, but I think the argument can, continues to grow stronger with me as, as time goes on. That I think it's for those people who kind of think, oh, you're just talking about picking the the, the best player, the one who scores the most points. They, they, they're forgetting that this isn't really about the top six, and that's something you talk about in the article. This is more about you know the, the lower teams, um, where they might have one point score that's worth talking about there, and because they are the talisman, um, who so scores the vast majority of their consequential points, um, they are the player to be looking at. And I think that's a really good framework to use to look for those players down the league. So, no, I definitely... It's something i agree i understand i also like that you've given use to words that could describe a bad student night out exit velocity and sloppy seconds um as well <laughs> you found a way to uh, give those a, an actual meaning as well but in, in terms of the actual interest i think for me it is that exit velocity stuff that was really interesting because I know it's something you've done in previous years, but I think with the lockdown, I think it was a pretty good uh, bellwether for what we can expect the players to be able to do when this season starts, more so than ever before. So, you know, every other year we've had this, you know, we could either look at the start of last season, which at the end of the day is, you know, it's always one year ago as the, the way these things work. Whereas this time what we had was we had a fairly short time off football where players had to keep kind of fit because they knew that they were going to be coming back within a pretty short period of time once they got back into training. And I think that's what this preseason, unlike any other preseason ever will be, is very much like that lockdown period was for players that they have you know there's a week or two where they kind of piss about and everything you know they're on holidays in lockdown it was we (laughs) don't know what's happening and then it's like okay head down because games are coming in approximately one month and that's that's effectively what we've got this time too and so uh with that in mind i I thought that was a some there was some really interesting reading in that i think especially a bamiyang came stood out to me because i'd had a bit of a just a question that I hadn't really answered in my own head about whether Aubameyang had dropped off or wasn't as good under the Arteta system and I think the answer is like no 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 he's he's just fine under Arteta and uh, that's um, maybe particularly interesting is that you know uh, in terms of his points his his consequential points they kind of all came through um, in a you know as about you know there was nine games after lockdown 10 for Arsenal he had about as many points as you'd expect from that in the final stretch of the season. So that's particularly interesting. The likes of Antonio, it's kind of hard to know what to think of their exit velocity. Yeah. But Aubameyang specifically stands out by a mile. And I think it's really well worth reading, if just for that, because at the end of the day, everyone's going to be thinking about who are their premium players. And I think he should be one of them. Yep, uh, fixtures missing, of course. All right, I think that's a uh, good point to end this week, isn't it? Yeah. Kind of uh, feels like we've reached the end of this one, but we'll be looking forward to coming back uh, next week when we have the fixtures and more to talk about in that sense. But for now, we were who got the assist, and we shall be back next week with more in depth analysis on the prices with the fixtures. And thank you very much for listening. Yes, thanks for listening all. It's uh, been a fairly busy pre season with uh, Tom's Talisman Theory article um, just about out, and then we've got the value article as well coming out very shortly. Uh, we'll be pausing next week to discuss the fixtures um, and also with FPL Family on the unwritten rules, followed by a final pre season pod for Game Week One. So, plenty coming out. Thank you again. Uh, it's very good to be back. Uh, great fun to play the game with these guys. Uh, do read my Tasman Fury article if you do get the time. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, I hope this assisted you in this initial look at the pricing and we'll speak to you next week. Goodbye. Slon. Oh, it's a goal. Who got the assist? Who got the assist? <laughs> <laughs>